So when we talk about electricity, we're going to go right down to the very basics here, and we're going to look at an atom. And when you look at an atom, an atom is made up of different parts here. We've got the nucleus there, and the nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons. All right, neutrons are neutral particles that basically uh, just give weight to the atom. Okay, protons will be evenly distributed with the electrons that are floating around on the outside. So there'll be an equal number of electrons and protons. What winds up happening with electricity is this. One of those electrons, the one furthest away from the nucleus, is going to wind up flying off there and hitting the next one, and that's where we're getting our spark at. So when we look at static electricity, um, you've probably done one of these two things before, maybe both of them, where you take a balloon and you rub the balloon on your head or you rub the balloon on your arm, and then you, as you pull the balloon away, you'll notice your hair stands out or moves towards it, okay? Uh, if you've ever walked on a nice new carpet, you kind of drag your feet along the carpet, and of course, what does that do? Well, that builds up some static electricity that when you go to shake somebody's hand, well, they find that electrifying personality that you've got, okay? Now, it's real important to understand there are three types of energy that we cannot see, gravity being one of them. Now, how do we know there's gravity there? Because if we throw a ball up in the air, it's going to come back down, okay? Magnetism, you can't see it. You can't see it, but you know it's there. How? When you take a magnet and you move metal filings around. By moving the metal filings around, you can see where that magnetism really is, all right? And electricity. You can't see electricity, but if you were to take some hair follicles and put them in a bottle of oil and then shake them, run a comb through your hair and get static electricity started, and then put it next to the bottle, those hair follicles would line up very similar to what that magnetism does. All right? So when we look at a magnet, it looks like this. All right? You'll notice... One's pushing away, one's pulling in. In this case, it's north is pushing away, south is pulling in. If we take two north sides and try and put them together, the magnet re repels itself. It doesn't want to get together, all right? If you do the opposite end now and you take a north and a south end and put them together, now it's pulling, and you've got to really work hard to keep them from, a, from attaching to one another because that's what magnets do, all right? So... The question is, what are the two types of electricity that we use? And they are AC, which means alternating current, and DC, which means direct current. All right? Now, when we look at our little example here, we see the picture of the battery and the, uh, the light bulb, okay? A battery is a DC electrical appliance, okay? It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to give out DC current. Now, there's a plus side to a battery, and there is a minus side to a battery. Remember, direct current moves in one direction only. So we're going to go from either negative to positive or positive to negative. As we do that, what's going to wind up happening is we are going to get two things. And what are the two things we're going to get here? Who can answer that question? What's the two things we're going to get? Heat is one, I and think. Heat is one of them. What's the other one? Uh, on, on this one, uh, illumination. Be light. Yep. We get heat and light out of it, okay? This is something that you're going to have to remember for the next few sessions that we're going to do because we're going to come back to that thought of what electricity is really doing here, okay? So when we have DC current, we're going from positive to negative, and we're moving in one direction only. When you have AC current, now AC current was invented uh, by a fellow by the name of Nikola Tesla, and back at the uh, 1893 Chicago World's Fair, they demonstrated his uh, invention. And so what they've got here is they're picturing four of the 12 1,000 horsepower two-phase generators that he invented. Now, I want you to know that even though he was the one that invented it, you'll notice it's Westinghouse that bought his invention, 
And that was the start of moving everything towards AC electric. Prior to that, everything was DC. All right? So we started here with AC electric, and of course, you can see the trolley car there and the old building there. The trolley car liked the fact that they were running at 17 hertz because 17 hertz meant you were getting lots of torque. All right? However, if you were to go inside that store there, the lights would be kind of flashing a little bit or flickering because at 17 hertz, you could actually see the movement of electricity through the light bulb, and it would pulse and give you a terrible headache. Okay? If you've ever seen a TV screen on a TV screen, uh, you'll see how they kind of roll, the picture rolls, and that's kind of what would happen here because you could actually see the physical electricity moving through the light there, all right? Now, we had to come to some kind of agreement as to what we were going to do in the world as far as how many hertz we were going to be running. So you'll notice here uh, on this chart, we're going to start out with what we know, which is 110 or 120, 60 hertz, all right? When you look at the current, when you look at the uh, uh, map here, you'll see all of North America. Now that includes Canada, the United States, uh, Mexico, Central America, and most of the Caribbean are what we would call 115 volt 60 hertz. You'll notice there's a big chunk of South America, Saudi Arabia, the western tip, I think that's the Ivory Coast, of Africa, and then also southern Japan. They're all 60 hertz. 115, 120 volts, okay? Now, the next thing we're going to look at here is 50 hertz, 110, 120, whatever you want to call it, okay? And you'll see here you're looking at uh, Madagascar and northern Japan as the two areas that have uh, 50 hertz, 115 volts, all right? The next one we're going to look at here is 60 hertz, 220, or 230, okay? When you look here, you're going to notice there's just a few spots in South America that have it, and then you'll also notice that it's also over in uh, southern China and Indonesia. The whole rest of the world, all that dark blue, is 50 hertz, 230 volts. 50 hertz, 230 volts, all right? Now, what exactly does all that mean? And that's what we're going to talk about. The generation of AC electric is done through a turbine, okay? We're going to take a coil of wire, as you can see there, and we're going to split it, spin it uh, in a magnet. Now, the magnet has a north pole and a south pole, or a plus and a minus, however you want to look at it. And so, of course, as it spins in there, what's going to happen we're going to go north, south, plus, minus, plus, minus, and that's what we're going to see as the uh, magnet, or as the magnet, move, as the wire moves through the magnet. And as it does that, we're getting a change there. We're bumping that, that uh, electron off of the atom and causing that spark. All right? This is a sine wave of one AC hertz, all right? Now, if you follow it, you're going to notice there that it goes to a positive, then to a minus, and then back to the beginning, all right? If you were to truly look at this, what you would see is a circuit or a circle. We've made an absolute circle here, okay? So that's what you're looking at when you really see electricity moving. We're, we're completing that circuit. We're going out, and we're coming back. It's more of a vibration than anything else, okay? Now, electricity is a little bit about wa like water, and the bottom line is we know water pretty well. So what do we know about water? Well, if we compare water to electricity, this is what we know. Water has flow. Flow is what does the work. With electricity, we call it amps or current, all right? Water also has pressure that it uses to move that flow, electricity uses volts to push the current or amps through the wires, okay? 
Inside the pipe, we have something called friction loss. Friction loss is energy that we pay for that we really don't get a whole lot of use out of. And, of course, when it comes to electricity, they're going to call that resistance. So you can see there are some similarities between electricity and water. And we're going to help to use those similarities to understand what's taking place. So we start out here, and you'll notice in the upper left-hand corner uses the word fuel. We're going to use some kind of a fossil fuel, some kind of a hydro fuel, or some kind of a nuclear fuel to power our plant. All right? Then what happens is we create some high amperage, and we push that high amperage out to our substation. Now, remember, amperage does the work. Voltage is what moves it. The one nice thing about AC is that you can switch back and forth from amperage to voltage. So when we get out to that uh, substation, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to lower the amps and raise the volts. We might go as high as 50,000, right? Then what do we do? We send that high voltage electricity along the line, the power line. Now, it can go hundreds of miles hundreds of miles. Then it gets to our substation. When it gets to our substation, our substation says, hey, you know what? We want to do some work with this electricity. Work means we've got to have amps. So they bring the voltage down, which drives the amps back up, and then they send it out to us. All right? We get it on the transformer, and then the transformer goes ahead and sends it into the house. Now, once we get in the house, this is what's going to take place. Coming into our house are two 115 volt lines, all right? If we were to take a voltmeter and put it between those two lines, we would wind up with 230 volts, all right? Now, we take those two 115 lines and we hook them up to what is called bus bars, bus bars. Now, I had a friend of mine, Don, who uh, tried to help me to learn electricity. He was a qualified electrician. And he tried to help me to learn electricity. And I really had a hard time struggling with this because those bus bars can also be called poles. Now, what made it so different is, or difficult is they would come up with this term, a single pole, single throw breaker. And, of course, I'm going, well, wait a second. If that's a bus bar, what are we calling it a single pole, single throw breaker for? And, of course, what it meant was they were taking that breaker and putting it on one pole. Now, single throw, if you take a look in the upper uh, right-hand side of that picture there, a throw is nothing more than a switch, all right? When it is closed, it's on. It's allowing the flow of electricity, all right? When that switch opens up, now it turns the electricity off, stops the flow of electricity. So that's basically what you're looking at there when they, say, when they say single throw. They mean it's either on or it's off. It's closed or it's open. Typically, it's going to be closed, and so because it's closed, we're going to get power to go down the black line, the black wire there. We'll take a closer look in a little bit in another slide here at those wires, okay? So we go down the black wire, and of course, we get the black wire to the plug, and now when we plug something in, the electricity is going to go from that copper spade that plugs in there up to the switch to whatever it is that we're plugging in, whether it be a light, a computer, a projector, a pump, whatever. It waits at that switch until that switch closes. Then when that switch closes, the electricity goes in, goes through whatever machinery we're operating here, and then it comes back on what's called a neutral wire, a neutral wire. Now, there's a very important reason why they call this a neutral wire. Because with the switch in the off position, there should not be electricity on that wire. And when you're talking 115 volts, that wire is going to be white. Most electricians know that a white and black wire means 115 volt, and they feel that it's safe to go ahead and touch that 115 volt white wire because they know as long as the switch is off, it's not hot. This is why it's important that you understand the coloring code for the wires, okay? That white wire is going to get hooked up to what's called a neutral bar, 
the neutral bar is actually connected to ground. And basically what happens when you have 115 volt is you're taking that electricity and you're going from your panel to ground. That's basically what's happening. Now, to protect us, we're also going to throw in something called a ground wire. And you can see the ground wire comes all the way over. And it is connected to that neutral bar also so that things can go out to ground if need be. Okay? Now, if I was to take my voltmeter and I went from the hot screw on the, on the uh, uh, panel there to the neutral bar, I would wind up with 115 volts. Okay? Because I'm going hot to ground. Now, when you're going to 30 volts, things change a little bit, and we're going to recommend that you use something called a double pole single throw breaker. Double pole means that we're connected to the black pole here, and we're connected to the gray bus bar. By connecting to both those bus bars, now we're going to get to 30 volts. Okay? We've got a single throw on there, so double pull means we're on both bus bars, but single throw is the same as that other throw was. It means that there's one switch, and when that switch turns off, it kills both of them, it turns both of them off. Now I can go from hot to ground to get 115, or I can go from that hot to ground to get 115, but when I go hot to hot, I'm going to get 230. Now, I got a call one time from a guy, and he says to me, my son has hooked my pump up. He just graduated from electrical school, and he hooked my pump up 230 volts, and, and we got a question for it. <clears throat> now, you'll notice when you look at the picture there, and I purposely picked this picture <clears throat> because the wire colors are red and black, not white and black. Red and black indicate 230 volts. They are both hot wires. Okay? So he says, my son hooked my pump up 230 volts, and we had a question for you. And I said, what's that? And he says, well, we're wondering what to do with the neutral wires. And I said, neutral wires? Where are you getting neutral wires from? And he says, oh, for crying out loud. You got a 110 uh, wire here. You got a 110 wire here. All right, and what you do is you hook up, now, mind you, we're coming from the disconnect switch here. We're going to hook up the two black wires to the outside, okay? Then we're going to hook the two ground wires up there. The two middle wires go to the motor, but we're wondering, what do we do with the white wires? Well, I've I got to be honest with you, okay? This is really a dumb question because the bottom line is, you shouldn't have to have six wires going out there, okay? What he was talking about basically is this. On his connections, and we're going to go back to the, uh, the uh, panel side here now, all right? You'll notice that the, when the wire comes out, right there, they've cut off that, that coating on the wire so they could take those wires into the panel, all right? The two black wires are going to connect to the two hot 115 volt uh, breakers, okay? The two ground wires are going to connect up here to the neutral bar, and the two white wires are going to connect over here to the neutral bar. Now, of course, you don't need that when you're doing 230 volt. When you're doing 230 volt, you only need two hot wires, so we could have done this all with just one 12 to wire to the ground, okay? But instead, they hooked it up that way, and I said, well, just take the two neutral wires, wire none of them together, send your son back to school, and have him learn how to do it the correct way. You don't need to have, and we, we really, you'll notice there, we also strongly recommend you do not do two single uh, hole, single throw breakers on a 230-volt system. Reason being, even though he's got one on the black and one on the gray, so it's hooked up properly for 230 volts, the problem is, should one of those breakers trip because something happens, the other breaker is still hot 
and now your motor is getting electricity that it doesn't need. And this can really hurt your system bad. So we really want to encourage you not to do this. Make sure you do it right by doing the 230 volt application where you're looking at a double pull single throw breaker. All right? And then the other thing that we want to talk about here is that I got a call one time from a guy and he says, you know, if you go one, if you go hot to ground sheet 115, you go hot to ground sheet 115. All right? When you go hot to hot, you should get 230. And he says, I'm not getting 230. I'm going, well, how could you not get 230? So I went to the engineer and I asked the engineer, how could you possibly not get 230? And he says, well, if they hook it up like this. Because if you hook it up like this, you're going to notice hot to ground will get you 115, hot to ground will get you 115, but both uh, breakers are on the same bus bar. And so because they're both on the same bus bar, they're both positive or they're both negative. And the bottom line is, in order to get 230 volts, you've got to have one positive and one negative. So this is why you would wind up getting zero on your voltmeter at this point. Let's talk about the construction of a submersible motor. In our next session, we'll talk about construction of a uh, above-ground motor. Here we're going to talk about the construction of a uh, submersible motor. You will notice when you look at submersible motors, there are two types. There's a two-wire motor and there's a three-wire motor. Remember, we make a permanent split capacitor motor. That's the motor that we make, all right? You'll notice we've got stator coils, and you can see if you look all around there, there's a stator coil on each side of the top, there's a stator coil on each side of the bottom when they cut that chunk of the motor out, okay? Those are the wires that we're running the electricity through, all right? Then we've got a rotor in each motor, the electricity moving through the stator is what's going to cause that rotor to turn. All right? Now, you'll notice that the two-wire motor, because it is a two-wire, has a built-in permanent split capacitor. So this is a run capacitor built into the motor. And that's why you'll see that the two-wire motor is a little bit larger than the three-wire motor, even though they're the same horsepower. And that's because we've got that capacitor built right into them. Okay? And again, we're going to talk more about why it's important that it's a run capacitor that's in there. All right? Next thing we're going to look at down here on the bottom is the Kingsbury type bearings. Kingsbury type bearings. Now remember, there are three shoes and that carbon piece that make up those bearings. And of course, they are lubricated. There is a small amount of fluid in this motor. And that fluid is used to hydroplane the carbon piece on top of the stainless steel shoes. And that's how that bearing works. This is why it's also important that you get that motor up to 1,800 RPMs in one second. So that way you don't wind up with those shoes uh, being galled. And now you wind up locking up the roller. And then on the very top there, you're going to notice that we've got an upthrust protection. And that's what that white piece is, so the thing doesn't move up too far. All right? So that's kind of what your motor looks like. We'll take a little more in-depth look here. All right? Before we do, I do want to do one thing here. I want to take the reminiscing back to the year, oh, somewhere around 1984. And because from 1957 to 1992, stay right, which was the parent company that I worked for, uh, used to make their own motors. As a matter of fact, I spent 15 years from 1975 to 1989 making motors. This picture here is a picture of Denny Fryer. He still works for us. And what Denny is doing, you'll notice, is he's pulling wire off that spool and he's running it through his machine here. What the machine is doing is it's calibrating to make sure that the varnish on the copper wire is evenly distributed, that there's no bare spots on that wire. Now he's not going to run the whole spool. He'll run about 100 feet, and then we'll just make the assumption that the first 100 feet is good, the rest of it's going to be good. All right? This is Julie, and Julie is running the winding machine. Now you can see here that she's hanging up some coils, 
And if you'll notice, there are clips on both sides of the coils, okay? And that's to separate the coils so that when the uh, inserter goes to put the coil in, they know how many wires make up that coil. This is Bob Mirage. Bob is running the automatic winding machine, all right? You'll see he's got a special tool here, and I can tell by looking at the picture from experience, not just by guessing, but just from experience, that he is running the starting winding. And you'll notice it takes up two of these to make up the starting winding, all right? So what Bob's going to do is he's going to insert those coils over this part of the machine first. And you can see it sticking out down here in the bottom, okay? Then he's going to go ahead and he's going to put his core over there. Now, because these are the starting coils, starting coils go in last. Main coils go in first. So you can see he's got his main coils already put in there, and now he's going to go ahead and put that stator on there. Then you're going to notice there are two clamps that come down, and they hold that stator in place. That way, when he pushes the button and forces the ramrod to push that starting coil up into place, that that starting coil will be in the exact same spot on every motor. All right? Now, this next picture is kind of interesting because this next picture is the hand inserting table. And I'll introduce you to Lois. She's sitting there. That's Marlon sitting back there. Betty's sitting behind Marlon. And that's me out of the picture. But I was close. I was almost in the picture. Okay? And of course, we're doing hand inserting here. We did hand inserting from uh, third horse to five horsepower motors on single phase. We actually went up to 30 horsepower three phase when I first started. We were doing six inch motors also. All right? Now, I want you to look at a couple things in this picture here. First of all, look at the length of Lois's core and then look at the length of Marlin's core. All right. It's very important that you understand horsepower is right on the top of the slide there. Horsepower is based on the core length and the wire size. So the more horsepower I want, the longer the core is going to be and the larger the wire is. All right. This is why you can only go up to five horsepower in single phase simply because of the fact that you can't get wire size large enough for 7.5 horsepower into the slot. So that's why you can only go to 5 horsepower. All right? The other thing I want you to notice in this picture is this wheel can turn this way. So you can turn it 360 degrees that way, and you'll notice you can also turn it that way, which means you can get front, back, slide this thing all around, and you can get to all parts of that wheel and that motor. Okay. Yes, that happens to be me. And what I'm doing here is uh, in 1984, we celebrated our 50th anniversary uh, here at the city, right? And so one of the things they did was they cleaned everything up, they painted everything up, and then finally they went ahead and invited the public to come in. They put uh, um, arrows on the floor to let people kind of walk through on their own and then they asked certain people to stand at the stations and explain what was going on. And, of course, everybody knows how much I like to talk, so I'm standing at this station. You'll notice the red circle there shows you the first station where we've got the core with just the Mylar inserts in it. And you'll also notice there's some Mylar sleeves. The sleeves are used to put the coils in and out. The second station over here where my hand is, um, what we're doing there is we're inserting the main coil. So remember, the main coil goes in first. And then if you look at the station behind me there, now they're inserting the starting coil. All right? When they're all done, they get put over here behind where the ladies are standing, and I want you to look at how bunched up that is there. Okay? So we've got to clean that up. Remember, there's an insulator in each slot. Remember, there's an insulator over the top of uh, each coil so that they're completely surrounded by insulation, all right? Then what we do is in that back side there that you're looking at in that last circle I put up there, we're going to put something called butterflies in there, and those butterflies are going to separate the main coil from the starting coil, all right? The only picture I don't have is a picture of Gail Rogers, and Gail, 
did the press. She operated the press. So basically what she did, now again, look at the back of the motor there, and then in this next picture, if you'll notice right over here, there's some string, all right? And if you look, they press those ends in, and then they use the string to tie them up. And that last circle that's there, the one that I forgot to put in the motion for, um, that's showing you that um, they're crimping. They're either going to crimp or solder those leads on. Okay, so they either crimp or solder the leads. We originally started soldering, and then later on in the mid-80s, they went to crimping the leads on. Okay? Now, when they're done here, and they've stitched both the top and bottom sides, they've got those leads in position where they need to be, um, then they send them over here to Henry. And when you look at Henry now, if you watch here, you see that red line I just drew in, not the one that's on his leg, the one that's on the uh, um, piece of pipe that's standing there. That's loaded with varnish. And that tube goes up to the top, and it's connected to a plate, and he moves that plate back and forth between the two uh, tubes there. Okay? Then what he does is he's got a little rubber piece and a hole. And he puts the rubber piece over the hole, and that tube, that red line there, that's a vacuum line. And so when he puts the, the little rubber piece over the hole, that creates a vacuum and pulls the varnish up over the top of the stator. All right? When he's done, he moves it so that the hole appears again. That breaks the, varn the, the suction there, and, of course, all the varnish drops back down. Now he goes ahead, moves it over the other one, well, I'll lift the varnish on that one. He takes that uh, stator out, hangs it up here, and drips it. All right? Now, behind him here, you can just barely see it, but there's some rods hanging there. <clears throat> when he gets all done, he's going to put those uh, stators on those rods and push them into the oven and bake them. Then when he's done baking them, they bake about two hours. When he's done baking them, he pulls them out of the oven, takes them off, turns them upside down on the hook, and dips them again. Yes, we double dipped everything. That's to make sure that it was a, a good finish on it. Uh, yes, there was an engineer one time who came along and said, geez, you know, if we only single dip, we'd save a lot of money. And while he was right, we did save money on varnish. Uh, it almost cost us our um, customers because the uh, motors weren't thick enough with varnish, and they kept shorting out. So that went away. Uh, this picture here shows you the smelter, and so what we're doing here is we're taking aluminum blocks, putting them in the smelter, and we're melting them down. And from there, they're going to go into an injection machine, and uh, they're going to be injected through the core of the rotor. Then when we're done, while they're still hot, they're going to go on a table, and they're going to be put in a jig, and the shaft is going to go right down the middle of that stator, of that rotor, rather. Sorry. And, of course, here's uh, Rex Edler. He was the last foreman in the motor room, and he's checking the rotors out. All of them have to be the same. And that's why he's got that uh, uh, caliper in his hand, so he can make sure that they're all right. Now, this is the shelling machine here. And in the shelling machine, you're going to notice right there is the shell, all right? So Tim pushed it part of the way in, not quite all the way, just so we get a picture and know if the shell was there. All right. Then you're going to notice that when he put the stator on this rod here, he's got it to protect it on both ends. All right. That shell is about the same size as the um, stator, and uh, so therefore what he has to do is he's going to close that top down, he's going to push the button, and he's going to heat that shell up with radio waves to about 600 degrees. Of course, as it heats up, that expands it a little bit. Then he pushes the button, and the ramrod comes in, pushes that shell right over the top of the stator, and the one that's the, the, the uh, piece that's by his hand there, that gets screwed on. He just unscrews it, and he can pull the whole stator off. And, of course, the, now the stator is inside the shell, and as it cools, it's going to stay right in the exact same spot. So once again each shell gets put in the exact same spot on the stator so that there's a, a correct amount of spacing on either end. This is Russ Weber, 
And Russ is one of the builders, or was one of the builders. And Russ is putting the pump together, or the motor together. So what he's doing basically is he's uh, putting the top and bottom bearings in. He's putting the rotor in place. Uh, he's connecting the leads. And then he's bolting it all down together. Okay? Now, there was something special about that Say Right pump, and it happens to be this connection right here. What made that connection so special is you could not over-tighten it. It is impossible to over-tighten that uh, connection, and that's why that connection was so special. Because the connection was so special, you will notice on the Faraday motors that we're selling now, that's the connection that they use. They pick the best part of all the motors from all the companies that are in the Faradine uh, group, and they said, okay, let's use the best parts. So that uh, uh, two-wire motor with the built-in uh, running capacitor into it, that was a Meyer suggestion. This is a stay right suggestion, okay? Then the motors went over to Harvey. Harvey Welch is his name. And what Harvey would do is we made oil-filled motors. So the first thing Harvey would do is he would connect the oil filler to the motor. He would fill that motor up. When he was done filling the motors up, he'd put them on the cart. When the cart was full, he'd sit down, and he would uh, do a uh, high pot test on each of those motors to make sure that they were good. If it wasn't good, he'd pull it out. Okay? Then the cart full of motors would go out by Paul, and, of course, you can see there what Paul is doing is he is connecting the motor to the liquid end. And then he's going to hang it on the line, and you can see it hanging on the line behind him in that red circle. All right? Now, the line is a lot different today than it was back in those days. Back in those days, everything was based off the old automotive lines, and so there was lots of, of uh, things moving around. Okay? We don't quite have that here today. But we still do tests. This is George Nodder, and George was our tester. You're going to notice there's a special connection on that motor. And over by George there, you can see, that's where the water connection is, and that's where the electrical connection is. So he would take that connection, he would connect it to the pump, and then he would go ahead and turn the pump on. Uh, that would cause water to flow. He could then check amps, he could check bolts, he could check flow, he could check pressure. When he was done checking it all, the next thing he would do is he would disconnect the water connection, and now he would connect an air connection here. And, of course, the purpose for the air connection is let's see how much water we can push out of that pump. So, again, while the process is not identical, it is very similar. We still water test each pump. We still use those special connections on them. So that way... Um, uh, basically, because there is a check valve built into the motor or built into the end of the pump, there is a connection there that holds that check valve open. They stick the pump into a 55-gallon drum. They connect the wires up to it. They turn it on. They run water through it. They look at the amps, the bolts, the flow, the pressure. And then when they're done, they take it out. They put it in a barrel next to it and connect the air connection to it and run air through it and try and drain it all out. If you happen to get a pump, and you open that box up, and the box looks wet on the inside, it just proves to you that, yes, indeed, that pump was water tested. Okay? Now, the next picture we're going to look at here is the winding machine. This is how we wound our, uh, our motors. Okay? So you'll see here, this area here is actually the same as that area right there. The big one is the side view. The small one is looking down from the top. Okay? Then what we would do is we would have our uh, wire here, that mag wire. Now, remember, it's a solid varnish wire with a copper coating over it. I mean, with a uh, varnish coating over it. All right? They would run it through the end of that uh, rod that's sticking out there, and then we'd run it over, and we would connect it. And it would be connected like this. We would hand wind it a couple of times. In other words, we'd push that thing around a couple of times. We'd get that wire connected to the end, and then we'd push it around a couple of times. There is a counter built into here that's counting how many times that uh, arm is turning. So when we're ready, we go ahead and we hit the switch and turn the machine on, 
and now it's going to automatically do it. And notice that what happens is, as you move from one size coil to the next size coil, that arm is pulling that wire back so it keeps it straight in the middle of each of those coils. All right? When we're all done, you're going to notice that we're going to disconnect that wire and bring it down here. And now let's count the number of coils we've got. One, two, three, four, five, six. I had a discussion one time with Peter Henning. He's our electrical engineer. And I told him, I said, you know, Peter, submersible motors, three-wire submersible motors, have a six-coil main. He said, no, they don't, Bill. They've got a 12-coil main. I said, no, Peter, I wound them for 15 years. They've got a six-coil main. He says, no, they've got a 12-coil main. So after we discussed it for a little bit, I realized what was going on. Because if you look at the front of the machine, you'll notice that each of these coils has two sides to it. Peter was counting each side as a coil. Remember, we clipped each one of those. All right? That so we would see them together. Now, we're going to talk, first of all, here of a single-phase three-wire motor. And that's what Marlin's making here, is a single-phase three-wire motor. You'll notice the length of this core. The core is made up of laminations. A lamination is 1 64th of an inch thick, and it's punched out of highly magnetic steel. And so what they do is they stack them up, remember, to the proper length based on the horsepower of the motor. And then after they get them all stacked up, there was a couple different ways that they could hold them together. Some of them were held together by cleat. Some of them were held together just by varnish. So it all depends on whether it was the old way or the new way of doing it. The varnish was the old way of doing it. Then what we would do once we got that core in our wheel is we would go ahead and put those um, mylar insulators in there. Now remember, an insulator means it's not going to allow the electricity to touch that core. Then what we would do is we put our sleeves in, and of course, the next thing that would happen is we would have to make sure, because we're doing a three-wire motor, that we've got a main coil here. There's 18 flats there. We've got a main coil made up of 12, and we've got a starting coil made up of six. So we would leave three empty slots, put our sleeves in, and then insert our first coil. <clears throat> now remember that first coil is going to have a wire hanging out of it. All right? Because that's going to wind up being our lead. Then we're going to go ahead and we're going to put an insulator over the top of that wire. And we're going to pull that wire down. Then we're going to go ahead and put our second coil in. We pull this down. We put our third coil in, we pull it down. By pulling these coils down, we still leave those three empty slots empty. And you can still get to them very easily. Now, of course, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to put in that fourth coil. When we do, we pull that coil down. That coil is going to lay in front of those three slots. You can't get to them anymore. Then we'll turn the wheel 180 degrees, all right? And we'll put in our fifth coil, we'll push that coil up, filling the hole some more in the middle of the stator. Then we'll put in our last coil. Remember, it's going to have a wire sticking out of it also. <clears throat> and then we're going to pull four, five, and six down. So four, five, and six will be facing one direction. One, two, and three will be facing the other direction. All right? That leaves the three slots on both sides open, so now we can put the starting coil in. So we put in number one, we put in number two, those are both going to get folded one way, then we put in number three, number three gets folded the other way. Then we go back to number two, and we split number two in half. All right? Then we form them with our hands. Once we get them formed, we put the uh, butterflies in between the coils to make sure that we were not going to get anything shorting out. All right? I'm going to colorize these for you just so you can see. So you'll notice the number one coil on the main there has the black insulator on it. The number one coil on the start has the red insulator on it. You'll notice 
that the number six coil and the number three coil that have the wires coming off, they're going to get put together and they're going to get a yellow sleeve on them. All right? So if you know anything about three wire motors, you're going to know red and yellow make up the start winding, black and yellow make up the main winding. And you can see how that's accomplished there. All right? Now, the split phase motor. There are three different types there. You've got three wire motor. This is the split phase. The split phase is a two wire motor. All right? Split phase means that what's going to happen is we're going to turn on the electric, and you'll see it's going to come down number one, and part of it's going to go through the main, part of it's going to go through that switch into the starting coil. The thing to remember is after three-tenths of a second, that switch is going to open up and those starting coils are going to disengage. And now all you're going to have is the running coils. Okay? That's going to cause just a tiny bit of vibration as that rotor runs past those coils that don't have any electricity going through them. All right? That vibration is going to get picked up through the rotor into the shaft of the motor, from the shaft of the motor into the shaft of the pump, from the shaft of the pump <clears throat> into the impellers, and finally from the impellers into the water. On the top up by the well, of course, you're going to hear kind of a humming sound as that vibration comes through that water. Okay? That is a two-wire split-phase motor. The other type of two-wire motor is a permanent split capacitor, the PSC motor. That's the one that we use, all right? With the PSC motor, now the electricity comes down number one. Part of it goes through the running capacitor and then into, the, into what we now call auxiliary windings rather than start windings. And part of it goes through, by the way, the bigger part of it, goes through the uh, main winding. Right? Now, what this does for you is this allows you to have electricity going through all the coils all the time. That's going to uh, really minimize the amount of vibration, if there's any vibration at all, uh, that you're going to pick up. And so, therefore, you won't hear very much noise coming out of a two-wire motor that has a uh, run capacitor built into it. And that's the purpose of making that split phase or that the permanent split capacitor motor that we use so that we uh, bring that uh, vibration down. The other reason is it also makes the motor much quieter. Take a little better look at that uh, the next time. Right? So this is a three phase motor. This is a three phase. So those first motors were all single phase. Now we're going to look at what is called a three phase motor. When you look at a three-phase motor, basically what you've got, the same 18 slots. So now what you're going to do is you're going to split it up into three even portions. So if you divide 18 by 3, that means six slots per set of coils. So we'll put our first set of coils in here. All right. Then we'll turn our motor. We'll put our second set of coils in here. And then we'll turn our motor and we'll put our last set of coils in here. All right. Now, of course, what's going to wind up happening is we're going to go ahead and we're going to put yellow on that one. We'll put black on that one, and we'll put red on this one. The key to remember is this. If you're using our motor and you're using our PID drive, all you need to know is those color combinations because that motor is always going to turn the right way if you hook it up red, yellow, and black. Hence the reason for using the colored wires. Okay? But again, with three phase here now, you've got a different signal that you're looking at. All right? Much stronger.